Good afternoon and welcome to our office hours presentation of crisis in Ukraine. Um, my name is Amy Oland. I'm the assistant director of professional and continuing education here at Oakland University. And I'm going to go over just a few housekeeping items before we get started here. Um, attendees will remain muted throughout the discussion, but if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box at any time and it will be answered time permitting. Um, questions can be submitted anonymously. If you would like to view closed captioning, please click the three dots next to more at the bottom of the Zoom window and click show subtitles. This presentation is being recorded and we will send it out to attendees next week. I'm going to kick it over to Dave Dulio, Director of the Center for Civic Engagement here at OU to formally get us started. Thanks very much, Amy. Uh, welcome to another edition of our Civic Engagement Office Hours series. If you have attended before, welcome back. If you're new to office hours, you should know that this is a collaboration between the Center for Civic Engagement, the OU Alumni Association, and our Office of Professional and Continuing Education. One of our goals with the Office Hours series is to demonstrate the expertise of OU faculty to both campus and community, and we'll certainly do that today with three of my political science colleagues, as well as two special guests. Now, today is a special edition of Office Hours for a couple of reasons. First, we didn't plan it in advance. But with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we thought it important to tap into our experts uh, who have uh, uh, specialties in topics like international conflict, international relations generally, and foreign policy. In particular, Christian Cantier, Paul Kubitschek, and Pete Trumbor are our featured faculty experts. I'm going to skip detailed introductions of them to save some time, but suffice it to say that they each can speak to these important issues uh, related to this conflict based on their scholarly training and expertise. Indeed, you may have heard them in TV or radio interviews in the last couple of weeks. They've really been everywhere uh, talking, about, uh, talking about the war in Ukraine and, and their analysis of it. Second, as I mentioned, we'll welcome two special guests, uh, both of whom have personal ties to Ukraine. Donna Voronovich is a special lecturer in art history here at OU, and she's going to serve as our moderator. But first, Taras Olesic is a professor in our biology department and is going to set the stage with some brief opening remarks. Over to you, Taras, and thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I just wanted to start saying that sometimes, uh, just just a short time ago, um, I put a blue and yellow Ukrainian flag on my house in Rochester Hills and a neighbor walked her dog and asked me, what, what flag is it? I really like it. I Googled the colors. Are you from Ukraine? And Yes, I am from Ukraine, um, uh, and and th this is the culture, uh, country with unique tradition and ancient history that existed for a thousand years, and uh, it, I'm one of the people whose descendants came to settle and love it for centuries. We have persisted through, uh, through ages and ages of uh, turbulence of war and peace, prosperity and famine, and and yet, despite all, all of this, only a couple of weeks ago, uh, many, many people didn't know that this country even existed. Um, today, though, it's difficult to even find somebody who hasn't heard of it. And, and that's unfortunately because of the war, this brutal and ruthless war that's happening right now, um, that you've seen the, the structure, destruction and casualties and maternity wards being blown off and uh, uh, children, children, pregnant women dying, uh, and yet be, behind, uh, besides everything, be, be, besides uh, the overwhelming odds, the Ukrainians, Ukrainians putting up a fight, and and that fight comes as a surprise to many, uh, because many didn't didn't expect this kind of uh, people have existed and they didn't really know how to relate to this. It, it came as a surprise to the Russians who really didn't think this, this was a, a big problem for them, but it also came uh, as a uh, surprise to Americans uh, that uh, who for a longer time saw Ukraine through the prism of Russia. Uh, all the journalists were in Russia, they were reporting things in Ukraine from a Russian point of view, and people came to believe that Ukrainians are just some kind of Russians that have some peculiar problems. Um, now, this may have uh, the, uh, shaped the response from the United States, the response that up to this point has been strong, but not totally adequate. Uh, it feels like uh, the Western powers that, in fact, 
may have created the monster that attacked Ukraine by 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 paying and buying oil and gas and other fossil resources and paying for tanks and soldiers and rockets that we're shelling right now. Um, uh, Western Western um, uh, powers have uh, imposed sanctions uh, as ha are helping Ukraine um, uh, with arms and, and, and psychological support and, and accepting refugees, but also they have painted themselves in the corner about what they can and cannot do, being afraid to confront uh, a bully who is uh, learning from every misstep of every uh, moment in which it it is it is um, um, being confronted, not being confronted. Um, so we, you know, I'm, I'm here to um, to tell you one thing that Ukrainians that may have surprised you, but they didn't surprise me. We, we know that Ukrainian people are strong, resilient, strong, resilient. They will not give up. They will fight to the end. Um, and, but this war is not only their war. This war is not just something about Ukrainian land and disagreements between Ukrainians and, and Russians. This is a war that should be touching everyone because it is, um, a conflict between people that believe in the same thing you believe in in life and happy and la life and liberty and pursuit of happiness and the people that only believe in making profits and extending their profits to uh, a, a, the, a, a, their empire of profits to the rest of Europe and as such as you know empires will not stop um, they only will gain their appetites and expand further and further so it is really everybody's job to stop this, to stop this war, to stop this bully, to confront it is everything we can so we can go back to a really real business that touches all of us right now, which is uh, saving our planet, other, other things that are important right now. We are going to expand upon in the questions that follow with our panelists here. So uh, thank you, panelists. I will pose the question and whomever would like to jump in and, um, and answer, um, please do so. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of see how it goes. We are planning on um, reserving about 25 minutes or so um, at the end of this session for questions from the audience. So. We have many, many questions here that we've come up with ahead of time. Uh, we'll be able to just scratch the surface. So the first question, what is behind Putin's desire to invade Ukraine? Does he want to recreate the Soviet Union? Does he want to recreate the Russian empire? Or is it something different? I'm going to defer on that one to my colleagues who are better positioned to talk to uh, uh, about Putin's mindset and Russian foreign policy ambitions. Kristen, do you want to go first? You want me to? You want me to go first? You can go ahead, Paul. Okay. Well, I would say there's a variety of things that that one could variety of ways one can answer that question. Putin himself has said that Ukraine is an artificial state that essentially that Ukraine's a part of Russia and he makes a historical claim of that and that the Ukrainians therefore don't really even deserve statehood. And he actually um, criticized Lenin of all people for creating the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic kind of as a proto-Ukraine, like there was no Ukraine prior to that. So in that regard, I would say really what he may be aspiring to is to create more something more akin to the Russian empire than, than the Soviet Union itself. But he has other sort of geopolitical ambitions. He wants to weaken the West. He believed, I think he believed the West was weak, would not um, respond very forcefully. He certainly didn't think the Ukrainians would respond very forcefully. And there's also an argument out there that I think is, is rather persuasive that Ukraine as a fledgling democracy, a flawed country in certain ways to be sure, but nonetheless, certainly people there are freer than they are under Putin's Russia represents some sort of existential threat to Putin because it shows that people can live in a democratic, a, a rather democratic uh, country right next door to him. Ukraine's seen upheavals. 
Um, he's had his eye on Ukraine to prevent you know, Ukraine from, from leaving the, the, the post-Soviet orbit and joining the West. And I think he saw this as, a, as an opportunity that would be relatively low cost um, to capture part of Ukraine, to eliminate what he saw as Ukraine drifting away and at the same time weaken the West. Christian, any follow-up? Uh, yeah, I would add uh, just to build on this uh, this argument that Putin is afraid of Ukraine. Uh, it, rhetorically, we've seen Putin recently say that the West and the the Ukrainians uh, have created what he defined as not Russia. Uh, so he sees it as kind of a mirror image of of um, a kind of an anti-Russian entity that does not deserve to uh, to exist now. Part of it, of course, is a, is a threat to the political regime in, in uh, Russia because there are indeed a lot of Russian speakers in Ukraine and they are indeed freer than they are in Russia proper. Um, so to Putin, I think this is not only ideological, he of course does not think that Ukrainians are a nation. This is very surprising to the Ukrainians, of course. Um, but uh, he also believes that uh, Ukraine poses an existential threat to, to his regime as kind of an alternative uh, to, uh, to a, an authoritarian, nationalistic, uh, kind of imperialistic Russia. It would be a 21st century Western liberal progressive uh, uh, democracy in which uh, Russians, Ukrainians, and others could coexist peacefully and, and have uh, normal and civilized relations with, uh, with the West. Okay, let me just add one last piece to this puzzle, and, and that is the context of the uh, steady expansion eastward of the NATO alliance since the end of the Cold War. Um, both Ukraine and, and Georgia have essentially been promised by NATO future consideration for membership in the Western Defense Alliance. And as NATO has moved eastward since the end of the Cold War, this has in fact raised uh, significant concerns. Um, certainly that, that uh, Vladimir Putin has been expressing for close to almost 20 years now, certainly since the, the early uh, mid 2000s. So that is part of the puzzle as well. Um, and that kind of goes into the larger sort of geostrategic um, context of, of what we're seeing unfolding today. Uh, Peter, I would like to uh, uh, add to this uh, because it seems to be a piece of a puzzle. But if you think in those categories, then, then you're really talking about spheres of influence. And uh, if you believe that there is a sphere of influence that Russia needs to control in order to feel secure, then you know maybe we should go back to 19th century. Well, um, I'm not saying that I believe that. I'm saying that, uh, the, the, that the Putin regime likely believes that. And which is which is exactly what what it, what why people say that they this this war should not be happening in 21st century. The reason this war would not should not be happening in 21st century because we should be thinking in the knowledge based economies. What would happen if China occupy California? Would it really benefit from Apple and Google? No, because that, that there is no real meaning to occupying the land in the knowledge-based economy. But Russia's economy is not knowledge-based, it's resource-based. It's all about controlling natural resources and controlling paths to, uh, to, uh, paths to export them. Uh, we actually enable them by buying this out and being silent and saying, okay, you can have this um, as long as uh, you don't kill too many people. And this, in, in fact, exactly what emboldened them. They actually think that, in fact, this sphere of interest uh, way of thinking is still valid. It shouldn't be valid. Um, and, and, the, and, and, and the fact that, uh, and there, we, we, I keep getting questioned, the fact that, that this may have not happened, that if uh, uh, Ukraine would not be promised to be a member of NATO, that is not true because as you probably remember, the problem with Ukraine and Russia started in 2004. This is way before Budapest, sorry, way before the Bucharest uh, a meeting of NATO. This is actually <laughs> after the Budapest Memorandum. Oh, Tess, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you. To protect Ukrainian integrity, uh, which is something they would not uh, feel. Remember all of the other European countries don't have nuclear weapons. The reason they don't have nuclear weapons is because 
United States protecting them with their nuclear weapons, except- uh, Kratos, can, can yeah, we yeah. get back, back to I'm the sorry. question rather than just sorry. continuing me, to yeah. filibuster? Yeah, sorry, let me, uh, let me pivot just a little bit based on something that Taras said. So um, let's go to, so Taras said, uh, we're talking about membership of NATO. We're talking about protection of Ukraine. Let's go back for a moment to the Budapest memorandum that was signed in 1994 when Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. Um, why hasn't that been honored? Why wasn't it honored in 2014? There was a big question then. Um, why wasn't 2014 a red flag to the West that Russia is capable of, of taking over a portion of a sovereign nation? And um, yeah, so I'll just, I'll just leave it there. It should have been a red flag. I mean, that's the short answer to that question, right? But the takeover of Crimea was in a, in a chaotic moment of Ukraine where they had their Euromaidan revolution, where they overthrew a government um, that was more pro-Russia and, and brought in a more pro-Western government. It was a moment of chaos, but the takeover of Crimea was largely peaceful. The Ukrainian military was not prepared for this. Um, the takeover of the regions in Luhansk and, and, and Donbass was, was more coercive, but, they, but the Russians found some support among the local uh, population there because of, of generated fears they had about the new government in Kiev. But the West should have stood up. There should have been harsh sanctions at that particular point. I mean, it was a violation of that. Russia did commit to protect and recognize Ukrainian sovereignty over its territory. And that was a blatant violation of that agreement and international law. And it was a huge mistake to let Putin get away with that. And I would argue that, that he's gotten away with a lot over the years. And I think that this has fed his belief that, that we really wouldn't stand up to, to what was ha what's happening today. Um, I, I, I would add here that Russia has uh, a long tradition of not, of not following through on agreements that it has signed, yes. primarily because it has a conception of uh, great power politics that's rooted more in 19th century imperialism, where a piece of paper is, is worth nothing uh, if you don't have you know, a military to, to back it up, as it were. So any sorts of promises that have been made or will be made by Russia in the future uh, should be taken with uh, certainly with a grain of salt. Uh, I, I would also agree with uh, Dr. Kubitschek about Russia constantly testing uh, the West. Uh, Putin has even tested NATO. Uh, some of you might have uh, heard that that Russian uh, operatives bombed a weapons depot in, the, in Czechia in, in 2014. This was an actual military operation on, on NATO territory. And the only thing that we saw, I think, was the expulsion of a few diplomats. To, in Putin's mind, I think the, uh, the invasion of Ukraine was supposed to be a difference of, of degree, right? So structural dependence, corruption in the West would have led to a toleration of, of um, Ukraine's occupation. I think Westerners, Western leaders seem to have finally realized that this, this is uh, really a difference of kind and that if nothing is, is done now it would uh, lead to a continuation of uh, of, uh, of Putin's uh, kind of goals in uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Look, I'm I'm going to offer what's likely to be another unpopular opinion, uh, but I think it frankly is a mistake to have ever believed that the West was going to militarily defend the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Whether we're talking about 1994 or 2014 or 2022, um, this is not something that I believe the West has any stomach for. And I think there are good reasons why they don't. You know, if we at some point get to the, the question in today's session about these proposals to establish no-fly zones over Ukraine, um, I will once again throw the bucket of cold water on why I think that's not going to happen. But I, I do believe that it has always been a mistake to believe that the West, absent Ukrainian membership in NATO, would defend the territorial integrity of the country. I, I don't think that's what I was suggesting. I was suggesting in 2014 that the sanctions that you're seeing in place now should have been put in place in 2014. There should have been real repercussions for, for Putin for what he did at that point in time. I agree with you that there's no commitment to defend Ukraine and it's probably unrealistic to, to, to believe that NATO or American troops are going to do so directly. But we certainly could have um, defended Ukrainian sovereignty much more forcefully, diplomatically, economically, politically than we did in 2014. It was a very low cost operation for Putin and he got away with it. 
he absolutely got away with it. Yes, no disagreement there. So um, kind of as a follow up to that, I wanted to ask a question from an audience member, from Ruben in the audience. He writes, I'm seeing a lot of talk about the potential for World War III in the news and national opinions. Is this comparison warranted? If you were forced to choose a number, what probability would you assign to the idea that the, that the, I, that the invasion of Ukraine will be looked back upon as the start of World War III? Honestly, I think that entirely depends upon what uh, the United States and its NATO allies do. Uh, unless Putin makes the disastrously poor decision to extend the war beyond Ukrainian territory um, and onto the, the, the territory of, of one of the NATO allies. I think if the conflict uh, stays contained to Ukraine, I think the odds of that are, are pretty remote. I, um, you know, I'm not willing because I think it's a mistake for political scientists to pretend that we can do prediction. Uh, but I think if the war stays contained, um, I don't see it escalating beyond where it is. That does not mean that there will not be tragic and have not already been tragic human costs. But I think if it stays in Ukraine, it stays limited. Well, you know, so we are, we're all now um, relying on Ukrainian people to uh, stop World War III. And we should, as Ukrainian people, to act accordingly and wisely to in fact defend the entire civilization with our heroic effort. That's basically what I keep hearing. And what I keep seeing is every step of the way, way, incrementally, the United States and its allies have refused to make any, uh, any, any uh, uh, decisive and, 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 and strong actions to deter the bully who has been growing incrementally more confident in what he can do. So if you think that by showing to the aggressor that you already painted yourself into the corner and therefore you're not gonna do anything this and anything that, that would be a great strategy to deter him, except for you just show them, well, this is what you're not gonna do. So all the other thing he can do, you work with the opponent has no boundaries and you show the opponent your boundaries. I really don't know how you can stop this by showing what you cannot do anymore. So, Taras, so, um, so to, to Taras's point, let's jump to the, a discussion about sanctions. So, um, the sanctions that have been that have been um, placed so far seem to some to not have taken any effect or made much of a difference. Others will say, "Well, there hasn't been enough time yet. Uh, we need more time for sanctions to take effect." How, um, how effective of a tool of a detriment do you think, do our panelists think that sa sanctions could be in this case? Have we imposed the correct sanctions? Are there others? Where's that line between providing, imposing sanctions versus providing planes as, uh, as Poland proposed to do? Uh, can, I, can, can I start this? Uh, I, I just want to say that uh, uh, when people ask me what's one thing you can do to deter the aggression, uh, I can't answer that. War is not one thing. Uh, war is many things. Sanctions are absolutely needed because these are actions that we take uh, to, uh, to compensate for all the money that Putin has uh, raised to actually build this war. So this should have started way earlier, uh, but it's better late than ever. But war is also other things, and, and uh, including military support and including psychological support, and other things uh, that I'm sure will come up when, when, when you realize that there's no way uh, to uh, uh, to stop by just saying things that you cannot do. Yeah. Thank you, Taras. Yes. If I could weigh in on the sanctions thing, and maybe we'd have disagreement among. The panelists. I, I think we've done a fair bit and we probably could do more on the sanctions regarding the energy sector or outright seizing a property of oligarchs or other sorts of things. There's more things we could potentially do. The question is whether or not this is going to have any effect. I don't think Putin particularly cares about the suffering of the average Russian. 
I don't, I think the oligarchs and, and Putin have enough wealth and position that they're not going to be threatened by a, a popular uprising in, in Russia itself. Um, so the question becomes, you know, to what end, you know, it's, it's, it, it's going to create some pain for, for them to be sure, I think, but to expect that it's going to fundamentally change Putin's position um, is, I would say, perhaps a little bit naive or, or extremely hopeful. And there's no question he's going to blame the economic pain on the sanctions on the West. He's already doing that. He had going into the war a lot of credibility and genuine support of a lot of Russians. Russians see him as a, many Russians see him as a trustworthy figure. Getting through the, 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 the state-run media campaign that's going to present only, only Putin's position and convincing Russians that this is Putin's fault, I think is going to be a fairly tall order. And I also think it'll be interesting to see um, we are united now. There are sanctions, maybe more in place. How long will this last? How long will this this will the sanctions be able to hold? Particularly if Putin decides, well, he might cut off gas to Europe, right, to retaliate, and that's going to have really severe repercussions because they can't find alternative suppliers to 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 uh, Russian natural gas. We cut off the oil. That's 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 really a, a small. We're not a small major uh, consumer of, of Russian oil, but it's the gas pipelines to Europe. That really, I think, are the crucial element here. And in that sense, I think Putin has a lot of leverage, and we and we don't. But others may disagree. Uh, you know, I I could talk about sanctions for <laughs> you know the next two hours. Uh, sanctions are the economic sanctions are going to hurt. They do hurt. They are not going to end the war, and that is asking too much uh, of a sanctions regime. Uh, the reality is is that sanctions have uh, limited utility in terms of producing big outcomes like this. Sanctions also will not likely lead to the ouster of the Putin regime. Um, we have seen that in the past, that sanctions that have been intended to lead to a country getting rid of a leader that we don't like has not produced that result, whether we're talking about Fidel Castro or Saddam Hussein. Um, that said, they are a tool that states, including the United States and our allies rely upon when we need to uh, demonstrate both to our own domestic uh, publics, but also to the international community, one, our strong opposition and our determination to do something, but also, and here's the key point, to limit the risks of escalation into a conflict that we don't want to get ourselves deeply embedded in. So sanctions are a tool to limit that escalation while still demonstrating disagreement, um, resolve, and so on. Um, I'd like to, to add here that uh, I, I agree. I don't think sanctions will help Ukraine in the short term. Um, uh, this is asking a lot of sanctions. Uh, the only thing that will help Ukraine in the short term is additional military and humanitarian aid to, to resist Russian invasion. That's the only thing that can help Ukraine uh, right now in the next few weeks or a few months. What I think sanctions will achieve, and this is not uh, necessarily uh, something that, that Ukrainians uh, uh, care about uh, for the long term, but I think in the next few years, what sanctions are going to achieve is reduce structural dependence on uh, Russian businesses and on the Putin regime in the West. Uh, Putin has systematically for the last 20 years uh, uh, taken over and exploited vulnerabilities in uh, uh, things like lobbying rules. There was a recent New York Times article uh, revealing how uh, US-based uh, companies, investment companies, lobbying groups, and so on are, are hiding billions of dollars of oligarch money. Um, some of these sanctions will help reduce and eliminate dependence on Russia, which I think is an, a, a net positive for the West. It is not a, a net positive in the short term uh, for, uh, for Ukraine. The, look, the reason that we often argue that sanctions don't work is that sanctions take a long time to have meaningful effect. And uh, if you are looking for a quick resolution, um, then sanctions are not the tool for you. Um, that's just the bottom line. Is it, is it fair to say, Pete, that the only real effective sanctions regime is that against apartheid South Africa? And that took several decades? Uh, I think that's fair, yeah. But also you have to remember how, how controversial that was within yes. the United States, how right. long it took the United States government to get on board um, with a meaningful sanctions regime against uh, apartheid South Africa. So 
Yeah. So, um, so speaking of meaningful sanctions, um, one more issue that's been raised recently is that at the same time that this war is waging in Ukraine, we have the Russians and the Americans sitting down with the Iranians negotiating the Iran nuclear deal. And there's been some suggestion that the sanctions that are being placed by the West are simultaneously being undone by negotiations, negotiations in the Iran nuclear deal. Um, of course, that's hearsay. Any comments on that? I have, not, I have not seen that report. What I would say is that would not be a surprise to me. Linking issues like that in a negotiation setting is simply good diplomacy, and that's simply good negotiating strategy. So I would be surprised if the Russians were not trying to leverage those sanctions as a way um, to, or, or leverage the Iran talks as a way to get a reduction of those sanctions. I would add that when it, uh, so it's not only Iran, but it's also China. What I think Russia is realizing is that it's also fairly dependent on, on the West and is trying to kind of restructure its economy uh, toward other countries, Iran, China, and so on. In uh, the short term, um, this will not be effective. Russia is indeed very dependent on, on Western products, on Western technology, and, and so on. The risk for Russia as well, as it turns toward China, is that it might become satellite of uh, the Chinese state rather than its own kind of regional slash uh, great power. So in the short term, I think Moscow will fail to um, to kind of uh, avoid most of the sanctions, uh, but we don't know what the long-term consequences uh, will be. Uh, I think that it will be a net benefit to, to China if I were to make a prediction for the next 20 or 30 years. Okay, um, pivoting a little bit to the, the EU and NATO. What are the likely consequences for the NATO countries and for the EU, for Europe, in the short and long terms? There have been even some suggestions, although uh, not terribly popular, that perhaps the US should consider leaving NATO, that we've become too enmeshed in the business of the European Union. I see, <laughs> I see you shaking your heads. I just had to ask. Um, so um, just a uh, kind of a continuation of that, has the US, do you believe the US has taken too much responsibility for protecting European countries? If I can start, I would say the clearest consequences is that the Europeans, and you're seeing this of the Germans in particular, they're going to they're going to spend more on their own defense, and I think they're taking NATO far more seriously as a defense alliance as opposed to a strictly a political alliance than they than they have before. You will see more stationing of U.S. forces in eastern former communist NATO countries. You'll see greater defense spending. You'll see greater defense spending on our end as well when the defense budgets come out. Um, and I think you're seeing a real valuing in Europeans of, of NATO, of, of, of the American presence there for that matter. I would like to believe, I may be wrong, I would like to believe that this event will put to rest these discussions that the US leave NATO, which I would find would be utterly preposterous and be exactly what Putin would want. But um, I think you'll see, you know, I think the pivot to Asia that we've been talking about may be over or at least postponed because we're gonna have to focus on this particular issue. And as for the European Union, um, you know, there's, it's another sort of crisis. They're gonna have to deal with the refugees, the humanitarian situation. But again, I think it's a moment for them to reflect upon the values that they hold. Um, they will not be admitting Ukraine anytime soon, but I think the idea that Ukraine is, is defending European values and all this, I think, um, does strengthen Europe somehow, that, that, that they feel that there's a, a stronger purpose uh, of, of beyond just you know, trade and economics, that, 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 that the European Union represents something even more valuable. Yeah, I think, you know, I think Putin has done more in the last 15 days to strengthen both, both, uh, both NATO and, and to create a greater sense of European solidarity than, than anything that's happened in the last 30 years, frankly. I, uh, I, I will give the kind of the Central and Eastern European perspective on, on this as well. I think uh, for, for decades, many Central and Eastern European elites have been talking about how dangerous Russia is and how NATO needed to consolidate forces in uh, that area. I think a lot of them are vindicated by the 
uh, by the Russian invasion of, uh, of Ukraine, I expect the eastern flank of NATO uh, to get uh, strengthened more significantly. Romania and Lithuania, for example, have asked for a more permanent NATO presence. Um, I, I do think that that is going to happen. Uh, but once again, the consequences here are fairly positive in the medium term for the EU uh, and NATO. They will do relatively little um, for Ukraine's ability to fight uh, the Russian invasion at the at the moment. So let's let's talk about Russia for a moment and the Russian people. We've seen many reports of protests in Russia against the war. How wide ranging do you think those really are and what impact are they likely to have on Putin and his thinking? Um, reported, there have been reported numbers of 3000 people or more, that was just from a couple of days ago that have been jailed in Russia for protesting against the war. Uh, those people reportedly will be facing prison time of, of 15 years, perhaps even longer. We also have the reports, of course, of of captured Russian soldiers who are contacting their parents back in Russia and trying to convince them that what the Russian state media is telling them is not true. And those uh, parents deny uh, what their children are telling them. So um, what do you think the likelihood is that Russia is going to, the Russian people will actually learn the truth and what impact might that have? Can I, uh, so I, I think it's very simplistic to, to talk about this kind of dichotomy in Russia between the evil Putin regime and the peaceful Russian people. I think it's an oversimplification. If you look at some of the, the polling, and one of the reasons why Putin can enact some of his policies, uh, a majority of Russians support the administration. In fact, support is increasing uh, in Russia at the moment. Uh, in the last week, the amount of nationalist hysteria that you see in Russia, on Russian media, uh, the social media accounts, and so on, is, is absolutely terrifying. Uh, I think what's important to understand is that Putin stays in power with some degree of public support. Now, this is, of course, a result of a number of different phenomena. Uh, for decades, uh, Putin has systematically eliminated any form of political opposition or any form of independent media. Uh, this has allowed him to control the information space and, and essentially brainwash a lot of people. Um, but I do think that many Russians indeed know what is happening and agree with what is happening. Um, it's not Putin who's driving all of those tanks or shelling the maternity ward in Mariupol. I think there is some degree of moral responsibility here uh, that we need to discuss. I'm not talking about collective guilt. But I don't think that we can make this kind of blanket statement that the Russian people are against this war. That is simply empirically not, not true. Um, and in the, in the medium and long term, I think it's a, an important discussion to have the, the invasion of Ukraine, I think, has created uh, kind of a, 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 a trauma that I think a lot of, a lot of Russians will, will have to kind of talk about for for decades, if not if not centuries, um, so it, it's important to not make this kind of dichotomous distinction. I think there is some moral responsibility there and some popular support. I tend to agree that there is support for the for the war. I mean, as I said, Putin was a trustworthy or viewed as a trustworthy figure, and so the the, the media narrative that he stitched together over a period of time, I might add, may be convincing to many Russians, and I think it's. I applaud the brave Russians that are out there demonstrating against the war at great cost for them, at great cost. But to suspect, to believe there's gonna be a popular uprising in Russia itself over the war and how that's gonna play out, I, I, don't, I don't see that. What I do think is a possibility, and I, 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 Christian, my, I invite you to maybe think about this, is the Russians have been brutal in the past. I mean, the Russians brutalized Brozny in the in Chechen war, the bombings that they've had in Syria. So we, they, they've done this before. But I am waiting to see if there is a point where those Russian troops, there's been talk about you know, morale and these sorts of issues. As the fighting gets worse, and it's going to get worse, and as the humanitarian situation gets worse, and sadly, it's going to get worse, whether you, whether you think you might see defections or other sorts of, of problems in the field where the Russians say, you know, it's one thing to bomb Aleppo, maybe, but it's, you know, or, or reduce it to, to rubble, but we're not going to do that to Kiev. I mean, do you think that's 
possible? I guess I'm posing that question to Christian, maybe to Pete as well. I think there is a chance, and there have been some uh, kind of informal defections by Russian soldiers who have just abandoned tanks and, and kind of run mm -hmm. off into the, uh, into the forest. Um, I, I don't think that we are would see something of the scale that we saw during World War One, when uh, you know when the Bolsheviks were just uh, bleeding hundreds of thousands of, of uh, soldiers who were just quitting and, and leaving the front. Uh, part of it is because I think a lot of these soldiers are afraid of what's going to happen to them or their families uh, back in Russia. Uh, but again, I think the the impression that the Russian soldiers have no idea what's going on uh, uh, and had no idea that they were in going in, into Ukraine. Um, that might have been true in the first day or two of the, the invasion with some soldiers. It is no longer true. They, they, uh, many of them know very well what they are doing and they know very well that there is domestic opposition uh, to, uh, to uh, some of the occupation. I mean, they're detaining hundreds of people in Kherson in, in a Russian occupied city. There's no way you don't know that uh, what you're doing is arresting locals for opposing Russian occupation. So I don't think the scale of defection uh, is going to be uh, significant or have an impact on the, the uh, nature of the occupation itself. And I think the other thing to consider is that uh, in a very real way, as it relates to the West, Ukraine has been winning, and it's, I think it's going to continue to win the messaging and narrative war. So a lot of what of the reports that we are seeing about Russian defections, about the abandonment of equipment, about uh, about conscripts claiming that they, they didn't know that they were in Ukraine, all of those things have been essentially delivered to us through this very effective um, Ukrainian sort of narrative creation. And, and the narrative that we receive is very different than the narrative that's being presented uh, to the Russian people. And so uh, it's hard for us, I think, from this remove to be able to say much about how was the war really being perceived? Um, how is it really being perceived uh, by the Russian public? And to what extent are we going to see um, significant resistance within the Russian military that's been deployed to Ukraine? I just think we, the, the stories that we are receiving lead us to believe a certain possibility is there, and I'm not sure it is. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just kind of to your point, to all three of you spoke to that, I think, um, in an interesting way. And I think it reminds me of something that I read just recently, that the idea um, that Russia doesn't want to be like America is something that we in the West um, can't quite wrap our heads around sometimes. So um, moving on. The, the Russian army's willful and deliberate attacks on civilians in Ukraine constitutes war crimes. And many such instances have been documented. What are the consequences to Putin of violating the Geneva Conventions, if there are any? Uh, um, there, aren't, there aren't any. None. There won't be any. And, and he doesn't care. Exactly. So I mean, that's, I mean, these are really these are really pessimistic answers, but uh, sadly, they're I think they're accurate. I um, <clears throat> I agree with that on Putin. I, uh, P uh, Russia is a nuclear great power, and uh, the leader of a nuclear great power is very unlikely to uh, be punished for for war crimes. I will say, however, uh, however, that I'm a little more optimistic about this in the uh, in, in the next few years. I, I, I agree with calls for Ukraine to create a, a Simon Wiesenthal Center of sorts um, to uh, make lists of people of uh, mid-level and lower level people that are committing war crimes in, in Russia um, and track those guys and make sure that they are, uh, they are caught or punished if they're outside of Russia. That is indeed possible, and that is one potential way in which some of these um, some of these attacks on war crimes can be rectified. But at the high level, Shoigu, Lavrov, Putin, I, I don't I don't think anything. I don't think the West is going to be able to do anything to them. Okay, uh, we're going to turn it over to some audience questions now. Uh, so the first one, this comes from several members of the audience. How is the war playing in the US? Will support last or will it fade? You know, I, I think what you have seen is very strong bipartisan 
uh, support for Ukraine among the American public, condemnation of Russia, and support for the American policy response. And, and I think this is one of the things that, um, that is a little bit of a surprise to me, um, that not necessarily that the, that the political establishment in the United States is, has arrived on the same, essentially on the same page, but that there is this broad public support um, that transcends party lines for once, uh, at least seemingly for once in, in recent uh, memory, um, that's coalescing behind, the, behind the, 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 the administration's response to the crisis. So um, that's where I think it is right now. My colleagues might have a different take. I have a slightly different take. I agree that there's general sort of consensus and big, big picture perhaps, but you know that you know any 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 policy subject to criticism, I suppose, right? So if we impose sanctions and gas prices go up, that's going to be you know that's an immediate sort of concern, right? And you've seen the Republic reports were out today that several Republican senators were criticizing the decision of the United States not to send those MiG fighter planes to Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. And it begs the question, like, how real is that criticism? I mean, I think that's a I. There may be people who disagree, but I think Pete, you and I think would be on the same. I think that's a bridge of probably too far to go to do that. But I mean, you're seeing criticism of this. So there are going to be cracks in this, right? It'll be debated. But it is, I think it is a moment that for many Americans who want to be away from the ugly partisan division that that, that we can unify around something here where I think, and I will just say, I maybe I think Taras will be happy to hear this at least. I think it's a fairly clear-cut issue in many ways. You know, I, I really do. And I think that we can say that we're defending, you know, the values that we hold dear by supporting Ukraine, how much we can do, how, you know, what we should be doing, we can debate all of that. But it has been good to see um, flat Ukrainian flags, Ukrainian lights, Ukrainian, I mean, it's, 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 it's been interesting to see that and it's inspiring. It's a tragic situation, of course, but it's inspiring to see the outpouring of support for the, the pro-Ukraine, you know, to help the people of Ukraine effort. You know, I think the other thing to just just to be aware of is that this calculation on the part of the American public could change should American military personnel be asked to put their lives on the line for Ukraine. A lot would depend upon the circumstances under which that that would happen. But uh, I think it is easy for the public to get behind a policy and to be willing to accept some economic sacrifice. It's, it's a, it would be a potentially very different question if it came down to uh, American service personnel being put at risk. But, but I think the Biden administration has been very clear for better or for worse that that's not or highly, highly yeah. unlikely that that's, that's right. going to happen. Although we can imagine some scenarios where you know, delivering humanitarian aid or a Berlin or a Kiev airlift, if you want to call it something like this, that, that might occur, that might entail some could entail some sort of risk. That's right. Escalation is still possible, right? Well, it I don't view it as well. Well, look, I think it's still possible that the conflict can escalate beyond, beyond Ukraine. Um, yeah. And the, the, the circumstances of that escalation will have a lot to say about what public response is and public reaction is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, from Cody in the audience, following up on an earlier comment, can we envision any scenarios under which Putin will seriously entertain using a nuclear weapon? Oh, can I answer that and, and deflect it to maybe a more, maybe a different question? Um, I would say as of right now, as the way things are going, again, Pete's provision that it stays within Ukraine, I would say no. Um, if you get beyond that and a tactical nuclear weapon, you know, I, I would say no. I, I find that highly, highly unlikely. I think what we, what we need to think about or we should be thinking about is what's, what is Putin's possible off-ramp in here? Mm -hmm. I mean, let's not you – know, how, how does he get himself – he's got himself in a very bad situation. And there's a lot of people, including myself, that would love to see him squirm and absolutely be punished to the, to the maximum sort of degree. But I think we know that's realistically not going to happen. There has to be some sort of off ramp where he can declare victory and kind of go home. And, 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 and you know, he's going to have to get something right, whether it's Crimea, whether it's part of Donbass. I don't know what Zelensky will give him. But I think these are beginning. You're beginning to see, at least from reports in the paper today, that the Russians 
um, would accept are not necessarily made, at least they say, not interested in occupying, you know, all of Ukraine or much of Ukraine, you know, they want certain limited things. Um, would we in the West, given our, given the, the anti-Putin um, feelings that, that and, and actions, um, be willing to give him an out? I mean, I think that's an, that's an interesting sort of question there, right? Would we be satisfied with Putin taking a small bite out of Ukraine and he stays in power for the sake of ending the war? I would ask, is it, is it our position? Is it our right to even ask uh, that question, <clears throat> put ourselves in that position? Just uh, yeah, so to, uh, to, to answer that question, I, I have a slightly different interpretation than Paul does. I think a lot of the negotiating tactics, so Putin started with kind of this maximalist demand to somehow denazify a country um, and then uh, eliminate Zelensky and, and all of that. And now he's just saying, okay, well, I'll settle for Donetsk, Luhansk, Crimea, and so on. Um, I, I, my hypothesis is that this is a strategy to re-escalate um, the, the attack on, on Ukraine as a way to kind of portray Zelensky and others as unreasonable. I, I also don't think that Zelensky is, is necessarily going to accept uh, some, of these, uh, some of these requests, even if he wanted to, right? So we're at a point where he's extremely popular, but I think Ukrainian, uh, uh, more than 2 million Ukrainians have had to flood their country. A lot of Ukrainians have seen friends and, and family die. I don't know if they are willing to somehow compromise with, with somebody who, who has done that. There might be pressure on, on Zelensky from the US. There probably will be pressure on him from countries like Germany and Italy to, uh, to kind of uh, you know, meet Putin halfway, as it were. Uh, but I, do, I don't see that going in a, in a kind of a productive direction um, at, at the moment. Uh, and, and we're not even talking about the fact that it's, it's really crazy that we're even talking about Putin's demands, right? I mean, this is a, a regime that invaded a sovereign country, took territory, and is now saying, I'm willing to negotiate, right? Um, uh, but that's, of course, that's uh, uh, kind of a, a, like a principle uh, issue. Yeah, let me add just one point coming back to the original the question, and, and then I actually have to go to class and, and teach, and we'll probably talk about this uh, in my class today, since I'm teaching American foreign policy. Look, this, this, this prospect of the potential for um, the use of nuclear weapons is why so many people are so reluctant to entertain the idea of direct Western military engagement with Russia. Uh, the fear of escalation is that once you go down that path, the, the logical end point is the use of, of nuclear weapons. And despite how emotionally heart-wrenching the appeals for military, direct military intervention uh, for the United States, for the NATO alliance, Despite how heart-wrenchingly emotional those appeals are, um, I think that um, in some ways to respond to them is, is irresponsible given the potential consequences. And, and I know that's a, that's a hard note for me to end my participation on, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think that that needs to be said. Can I, uh, so I, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll disagree uh, here with, uh, with Pete. Uh, Putin wants to stay in power. Uh, He's afraid of losing power. Using nuclear weapons is a surefire way of losing power. So I think it's extremely unlikely that he would use a nuclear uh, weapon. I also want to mention the fact that to Central and Eastern Europeans, when we hear um, about the kind of the idea of concessions with Putin for fear of a nuclear attack, um, the same logic, I think, could be applied not only to Ukraine, but the concern is that uh, we're going to hear the same thing about Poland or Estonia or Lithuania and other countries. So I think the logic here, the logic of the risk of a, of a nuclear conflagration is extremely minimal. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm actually quite puzzled. I, I think the U.S., of course, uh, this might be a remnant of the Cold War. There's just been a lot of, you know, for for decades, there's a huge concern that there would be like some sort of nuclear uh, conflict. I think the risk of that is is extremely minimal, and I don't think Putin is going to to, to use a nuclear weapon. I think that's extremely unlikely. Paul, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we wrap it up? No, no. I, I just say thanks. Thanks for organizing this, and thanks to all the audience members. I hope that we made some enlightening and informative 
comments um, that they got something out of, out of being here today. So thank you. And thank you for moderating. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience members. Um, I just you. wanted to uh, I just wanted to close with a quote here. It was actually written by Amanda Gorman, um, who most of you will recognize as the National Youth Poet Laureate, who wrote a poem and delivered it um, very effectively at the inauguration of our President Joe Biden. Um, she wrote this in the context of social justice for African Americans and for people of color in this country. But I, I wanted to read it today because I think it, um, it extends to all of humanity and certainly I think it extends to the emotions of the Ukrainian people right now. She writes, quote, while we might feel small, separate and all alone, our people have never been more tightly tethered. The question is not if we will weather this unknown, but how we will weather the unknown together, end quote. And that just also sort of reiterates the message that Taras started with, that this is not just the Ukrainian people's war, it's, it's all, of, all of our war. And um, so the support that is being shown by people all over the world is greatly appreciated by the people of Ukraine. Um, once again, um, just in closing, thank you all for your participation. And I will hand it back over to Amy now. Yeah, just to give you guys a little bit more info about what we have coming up here. Um, you can join us at the Ukraine Information Table uh, in the Oakland Center in front of the Habitat from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. from March 7th through March 11th. Um, and then there's going to be a light and memorial candle ceremony in honor of the victims of war. So make sure to come out for that. And in addition, you can join us. It actually skipped my little slide here. Let's try this one more time. Um, for our next office hour session on political hot topics on March 24th from 7 to 8 p.m., we'll have Dave Dulio and Nicole Matthews from the Department of Political Science. Um, so make sure you register for that at oakland.edu backslash alumni backslash events. And then there's a little bit more information about all of us involved in this partnership here. Obviously, the Center for Civic Engagement, um, my unit, Professional and Continuing Education, and the OU Alumni Association. So thank you again, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.